Good morning, okay. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday school. This is the second uh, Sunday that we are having our services uh, here in this building. But right now we are streaming, uh, and this is our second lesson in uh, Second John. Before we start, uh, let us uh, read from our text, and that is Second John verses one to four. Second John verses one to four, and it says there. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, once again we are here before Thee. We ask that uh, Thou will guide us and give us understanding on the truths that we have to learn today and that we can apply them in our lives. Help us, give us uh, wisdom, and give us the right focus and attention so that we can give uh, full concentration on the things that You are to give us help those who have difficulty in accessing this that I will give them um, access and thank you once again for the resources that has given us in Christ and we pray amen so as I've mentioned uh, before the second John and third John and I guess Philemon and Jude they are the what we can uh, what we can surmise as uh, short episodes in the New Testament. In fact, uh, some um, avid fan of the Bible, they call them uh, the postcards of the New Testament because they are uh, letters sent to individuals and even churches, but they are so short compared to the rest of the letters in the uh, Bible. Uh, Second John particularly is, uh, can, was written in just one page of papyri. And the theme of John, if you will notice in uh, first, uh, Second John, you will note that there are two, two main words that he used here. The first one is truth, and the second one is love. So we started last week with our uh, study in verses 1 and 2. As a recap, we studied that, number one, the truth unites believers. The truth unite, uh, unites believers. We can see that in uh, verse 1, and it says there, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. Now, here we can see that Apostle John was commending the elect lady. As we have uh, previously mentioned, that this elect lady uh, some are considering this as a local particular church, and some are considering this also as a literal elect lady and her children. But even if we take this either way, the interpretation of uh, Second John will almost always be the same. Now, first point that we can see here is that the truth unites believers. How can the truth unite believers? Now, number one, we can see that First of all, there should be acceptance of the truth. Acceptance means for us believers, we know this as uh, John uh, 14, 6, it uh, was mentioned by the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, acceptance of the truth means we people recognize that we are sinners, and therefore we need the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, accepting him as our Savior, that we cannot do anything on our own to save us ourselves, but it is God who gave us, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by grace, the salvation. So this is the first ingredient in any uh, unity. If there's unity in the truth. Now, as I mentioned before, now nowadays you can see that a lot of people are in disagreement, even our society. Uh, this is unprecedented in the disagreement. Why? because there is no unity in the truth. Some people are saying that you need to do this, you need to reform the police, and some people are saying that you need to do other things, but 
the basic uh, truth that we can see here is that we need to change ourselves. We need to change the human being. And the only th way that that can be achieved is by the acceptance of the Lord Jesus Christ, acceptance of the truth. Secondly, we saw that we can only be united in the truth by agreement with the truth. By agreement means we have one standard that we are to pursue, and that is the Bible, the truth of the gospel. Third thing that we study this is the appreciation of the truth. When we say appreciation of the truth, it means that how we value the truth. Some are, are giving the lip service that they love the Bible. Some are saying that uh, this is the way that I live. But given crises and difficulties, they abandon the truth of the scripture and they don't appreciate and give due priority to the Bible. But for believers, and even in families, we can only have unity if we have priority in the truth, priority in giving uh, what is in the scriptures, the truth in scriptures. Fourthly, we saw that in order for us to have unity in the truth, we need to have apprehension of the truth. We cannot fully understand the Bible, even in our lifetime. It's so vast and it's not enough in the duration of our life that we will be fully understanding what the Bible is. But Deuteronomy 29, 29, I believe it says there, the secret things belong to God, but the truth revealed, we need to learn them. And the truth that is given to us, they are the things that we are to live by and apprehend. Apprehension means understanding. If we don't learn, we, we're not governed by the scriptures, by the truth of the gospel, we can never be united because we will be using our own sets of values apart from the scripture. That's why we need to have one standard and we need to have understanding of that standard. Now, secondly, last week, we also uh, learned that not only does the truth unites believers, the truth also indwells the believer. What do we mean by this? We can see this in 2 John 2, 2, where it says there, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Now, in our study last week, we said that when the truth indwells us, number one, there is commitment to the truth. That's what we can see in uh, those uh, clause, uh, for the truth's sake. We see here that this phrase, that commitment uh, for the truth's sake, tells us that Apostle John is doing the writing and even loving this uh, elect lady and her children and even uh, other believers. Why? Because of the truth. This is also true with Apostle Paul that he underwent a lot of adversities, sufferings, and heartaches. Why? It is for the truth's sake. Now, which means this is commitment to the truth. Now, secondly, we also uh, saw that indwelling the uh, truth indwelling the believers means that there should be communion with the truth. Communion with the truth. And as I mentioned earlier, John 14, 6, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which means that once we accept the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and Lord, we will be, we are assured in the scripture that God indwells us. And indwelling in the sense that he will live in us. And for us to commune with the truth, we have to place the Lord Jesus Christ, place God on the throne of our hearts, that we are not to be uh, ruled by our emotions, by our values, by our liking, but set that aside and put the Lord Jesus Christ, God, as the King and Lord of our lives. This is communion with the truth. And thirdly, we also see that not only can we have uh, communion, but also we can have confidence in the truth. Now, this is assurance from God that whatever he says is the truth. In fact, 
if we put this basically, when God indwells us, which means this is uh, assurance of our salvation, that whatever God says, He will fulfill. And a lot of God's promises, they will be fulfilled by God. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And if we have communion with the truth, and if we are committed to the truth, then we will have confidence in the truth. Now, today we'll be starting with the next point that uh, the Apostle John mentioned in these first four verses of his uh, second letter. Now, not only does the truth unite believers, not the truth in those believers, thirdly, in verse 3, we can see that the truth blesses believers, the truth blesses believers. That you can see in 2 John uh, verse 3, it says, Grace be with you and mercy, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and in love. Now, we can see here that God's grace is God's unmerited and undeserved kindness. God's grace is God's unmerited favor and undeserved greatness. That's the first point that we can see. Now, if we are united with the truth and we do all these things that we can see that we accepted this truth and we are in agreement and we give value to this truth and if the truth indwells us occupies our heart then it will give us blessings and number one blessing that we can see here is grace grace is god's unmerited and undeserved kindness now grace views sinners as guilty and undeserving but because of God's grace, He freely bestows this kindness, this undeserved and unmerited favor to us because we are unworthy of it. And because of our unworthy, due to His love and kindness, He gave us grace. We can see here, in fact, if you will turn to uh, Romans 5.20, it says there, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What is Paul saying here in his letter to the Romans? What he's saying here is it doesn't mean to say that when the law was given, that sin or transgression multiplied. No, what he's actually saying here is like, it is comparable to a magnifying glass. Now, if you see with your naked eye an object, you will just see what the naked eye can see. But if you use magnifying glass, you will see more details about the object. The same is true with the law. It magnifies. It doesn't increase the number of sin, but it gives us more details. And in our mind, the law gives us the heinousness of the sin, the wickedness of the sin, to the point that we will, on our own, recognize our sinfulness and our wickedness, that this will push us to a Savior because we will realize that we are insufficient and we cannot do on our own the things that God wants us to do. And therefore, by realizing this need of ours, we will go to God and because of this, grace will abound. Why? Because the Lord, God through the Lord Jesus Christ gave us the access to God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. That's what Romans 5.20 is telling us. 
the law causes sin to stand out in our consciousness that we are pushed to the limit that we will try to seek other means and that other means and the only means is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the law was given so that we will realize and it will prevent us from imagining that on our own we can overcome sin and realize that we are sinners and need grace from God. So, if we know this truth, then God will bless us with this grace. Ephesians 1 7, it says there, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So we are forgiven because of God's grace. We, God's law was given as part of God's plan for man to realize his sin. And when he realizes his sin, then he will avail of God's grace, the offer of God's grace. Now, second uh, blessing that we can see here, aside from grace, is mercy. That's why grace be with you, mercy. So, he said here, mercy views sinners as needy and helpless. So, grace views us undeserving and unworthy, but mercy views sinners as in need and in need of help and helpless. So, mercy speaks of God's compassion and pity. Mercy speaks of God's compassion and pity. This is his tenderness, his readiness to forgive. Matthew 5.3, it says there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because God will give us mercy. We know that we are needy and helpless. Therefore, God in his mercy will give us heaven. Matthew 5.3 For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Titus 3.5 Titus 3.5 It says there, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So we can see here the work of mercy. Grace and mercy. And the third blessing that we can see in this verse is peace. So he mentioned that grace be with you, mercy, and peace. Now, peace is the result of God's abundantly giving grace and mercy. So if God gives us grace and mercy, what follows next is peace. In the Hebrew concept of peace, Peace to the Hebrews is emphasizing the wholeness and the well-being of life in all aspects. That is what peace is all about. It is our integrity, our wholeness, and our well-being in every area of life. You see, the truth of the gospel does not only pertain to spiritual things. The truth of that we can find in the scripture, it affects material things, our physical being. And that's what we can see here in the Bible. When God gives us grace and mercy, what follows next is peace. Which means that the idea here when, when we talk about peace is that any hostility, any enmity between God and man is removed because of God's grace and God's mercy. Romans 5.1, it says there, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, it said, being justified by faith. This talks about salvation. We can only be justified not by doing good things or not by, or 
by our own efforts, but justification is by faith. You remember Ephesians uh, 2, 18, 19, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Now, you can see here, we can see here in Romans 5, 1, that once we receive the justification, then we will have peace of mind. We will have peace with God. Colossians 1, 20. Colossians 1, 20. It says there, And having made peace through the Lord, through the blood of of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him i say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven so we can only have we can only make peace with god if we recognize that we cannot save ourselves that we are sinners and we cannot save ourselves and by accepting god's mercy Grace is God doing for us what we do not deserve. Mercy is God not doing to us what we do deserve. And peace is God giving us what we need based upon His grace and mercy. Those three are working together for the benefit of the person who trusts God. All these divine blessings come from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you can see in that verse where he mentioned that, uh, he said, you will notice here, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God and the Father, and God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. You will see here that those two preposition from, God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an indication from John the Apostle that the Lord Jesus Christ is equal with the Father in using this preposition, from, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, which means this, all blessings come equally from God the Father and God the Son. So James 1.17, it says there, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, if you will notice here, that word gift, the first word give is different from the second word give. The first word give there is the act of giving. The second word give described as perfect give is the thing given. With these two you will know, with these two, uh, with these two uh, phrases, you will know that the beginning and the ending of the gift from God. And it is described as every good gift, every intention of God is good. Why? Because good here means that God's intention in giving us, His act of giving, they never foster evil, desire, or desire obscene that is why they are good the gifts of god are perfect because they are fulfillment of his will to his people so whenever you receive a blessing if it is from god it is good which means it will not give us the desire for evil or sin and it is perfect why because this is part of God's will and plan for our lives. God, grace, mercy, and peace, peace are present when truth dominates our mind and our hearts. Truth unites believers, truth involves believers, and when this happens, it will give us blessing. The last thing that we can see here is that 
we can see that in 2 John verse 4, where it says there, And I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. So, a final thought about this truth is that the truth controls believers. The truth controls believers. Not only can we see that whenever we understand truth and we have an agreement with the truth, that this will unite us. And when we meditate upon this truth, it will indwell us and it will give us blessing. But accepting truth does not just mean giving assent or saying yes to this uh, truth. If you will notice there in the first verb that you can see in verse 4, it says, I rejoice. Rejoice means he's overwhelmed with joy. And that's the first thing that we can see here is that the motivation is obedience to the truth. How can the truth control us when this is our motivation? When we desire in our hearts, then when we find joy, whenever truth is valued, whenever truth is applied, that's what you can see. I rejoice. In fact, if you will notice this, this is not actually, you will notice here that this is in passive voice, which means that he receives joy because of the truth. He is controlled by the truth. Apostle John, when he saw the some of the children of this elect lady, if we will take it literally, this is the children of the elect lady, if we will take this as a church, then this means that some members of the church, he saw them, and in them, we, he saw the, they apply the word of God and live according to the truth. And when he saw this, he was joyful. In fact, you will note here that every time that you will see here, he rejoices that Whenever you see someone applying, whenever he saw someone applying the word of God, he was joyful. Uh, the same is true for us believers right now. Whenever we see people applying God's word, we are encouraged. We rejoice. Now, I have the privilege of uh, recording the giving in the church. And when I see a lot of this uh, offerings coming in it's not because it's not because the amount of the giving that uh, we receive it is the faithfulness it is the obedience of God's people it is the product of their understanding of what they learn in the scripture I am encouraged and this I believe goes through with all of us. As parents, we see our children applying what we uh, taught them, what they learned from the scriptures. We rejoice when we ever we see that. Even in our friends, when they apply the word of God, we are rejoicing. But when they go contrary to what the scripture is saying, we are disheartened. And that's what we can see here. The truth controls us. Why? Because first of all, this is the motivation. This should be the motivation of our lives. In fact, this is not unique in this episode alone. Third John, if you will go there, third John verse three, it says there, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, and even as thou walkest in the truth. The same John mentioned that in here. Now, in verse 4, he mentioned that I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. You see, the same goes 
for him. And he saw these uh, believers walking in the truth. He was rejoicing. And this is just at the top of my mind. In, in Hebrews, you will see there that we are to submit and obey the rulers of the church, the leaders of the church. Why? Because they shall give account. And when we follow the teachings of the scriptures, these same rulers are happy. That's the essence of that verse. Second point regarding this is that it is not only the motivation is obedience to the truth. But secondly, the measure of obedience is our daily walk. How much should be, how much should we be controlled by the truth? It says here, walking in truth. It says there, uh, I rejoice greatly that I, in Second John uh, verse four, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. Now, walking in truth means moving through life controlled by the truth. Moving through life controlled by the truth. That's what walking there means. Walking, most of the time when you, we read that in the scripture, it means the behavior. Our, in fact, this is also mentioned as conversation of our lives, meaning how we live our lives. And these children of the elect lady and even the elect lady, we see them as walking in the truth, meaning moving through life, being controlled by the truth. Hosea 14.9, if you will go there with it. Hosea 14.9, it says there, who is wise and he shall understand these things, prudent and he shall know them, for the ways of the Lord are right and the just shall walk in them but the transgressor shall fall therein. You know what Hosea is saying here? He said, it's a rhetorical question. He says here, who is wise? When he said here, wise is someone who is shrewd, someone who has the capacity to understand and discern. He said, if you are wise, then you will know that the only way of living, the only way that we can move through life is by walking in the truth. Wisdom will tell us that whenever we apply God's word, this is the wisest choice. If you will just think about it, Every time you have choices, you are given the choice of God's truth to apply in your life or the other way. And when you apply God's word, at the end, you will realize that this was the best course of action. But if you did apply the other wisdom provided by either this world or yourself or the devil, you will be regretting it. That's what Apostle John is telling us here, that the measure of our obedience is our daily walk. When do we apply God's word? Is it when it is convenient? When it is easy to do? Sometimes we say that I know the truth. Now, Knowing the truth is not enough. We hear preachings. We do our devotion. And we have a lot of information. But this information, they're nothing if we don't apply them in our lives. When we, are, when we do things based on emotion, like, for example, a sudden, uh, a sudden event, and we are so emotional that instead of applying the scriptures, we apply our emotion to handle things. When 
it calls for wise decisions. Sometimes we are governed by our emotion. Sometimes we do things because we are angry. Now, I read a book uh, about a couple of weeks ago that it is mentioned there that in order to have a happy life and fruitful life, he said that we need to be still. Which means we need to take time out before we proceed with things. And I believe this is applicable also whenever we do things. And if we are to apply God's word, when we are bombarded with adversities in life, then we are to stand still for a while and wait for God and meditate on God's truth and apply the truth in God's word. And we are to do this, the measure is daily, all the time. And the last point with this is the magnitude of obedience is a scripture. What are we to apply? It says there, it says there that walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. That word commandment is the other name of the Bible, of the scriptures. That's what we can see in Psalm 19.8 where it says there, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Statutes, commandments, in this verse refer to the Word of God. So we are to walk in the truth, the truth expounded in the Scriptures. That is the magnitude. Everything that God says, we need to obey. We need to walk in them. We need to, we need to govern, and they are to govern our lives and rule our lives. 1 Timothy 6.14, it says there that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see here that we are to do these things, applying the scriptures, learning the scriptures, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. What's happening today in our society is very disheartening. There is disunity. Why? Because there's a lot of teachings and dogma being put in very subtly in our society. But in order for us to have unity, in order for us to gain the blessing of truth, we need to be controlled by the truth and not controlled by other things like emotion or wrong teachings. This is the warning that the Apostle John gave to the elect lady. Truths that would prevent her from entertaining false teachers. You see, the truth that we have in the scriptures, they don't only bless us. They also protect us. In our, in, in our succeeding lessons, we will see why the Apostle John wrote this elect lady this episode. I hope you will be with us in those succeeding sessions. Thank you once again, everyone. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, once again, we are so thankful for your goodness to us, providing us with your word. Help us to understand Meditate upon them and apply them in our lives. For these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen.